We are back on the record in State versus Jesse Kershevsky. Appearances are as they were before. Uh, court has reconvened after the lunch hour to uh, pronounce sentence in this case. Before I pr pronounce sentence, though, I, I do want to go through some of the remarks that were made here today and my impressions of this case, this trial, and the jury's verdict. Not commenting on their verdict, but we're here today, first and foremost, because there were three jury verdicts in this case, three guilty verdicts, one for intentional homicide and two for theft. And that, of course, was the culmination of a case that was initially filed in June of 2021. Of course, not the start of the investigation, not the start of um, legal problems for the defendant. I'm well aware that ultimately in 2019, you were revoked in part due to allegations related to these charges. And it was basically upon your discharge the day before that this case was filed. Now, from my perspective, not only was this a very unusual case due to the allegation of a poisoning uh, by an over-the-counter substance found in Visine, it was unusual because of the amount of time that was put into the investigation. I don't think anyone watching this trial, sitting in this courtroom, or even watching you know, summaries of it, was surprised that in October of 2018, the death investigation, which was very normal, uh, any time someone was found deceased outside of a hospital setting, required a death investigation. I don't think anyone was surprised that initially people on scene thought it was a suicide. That's the call that came in. That's how uh, really the scene looked. I think it was Detective Loberg who said there were no signs of forced entry. He looked outside. He looked inside. There wasn't anything to suggest any type of external trauma. He'd been on overdose cases uh, in the past. You know, there weren't any syringes found or anything like that, but there were the crushed pills and some other things. And I think that scene was made to look a certain way for a reason. On the one hand, the defendant wants us to believe that this is all a big mistake, that this was a suicide. And of course, the state presented a case to a jury with a lot of evidence, and a jury found that it was not a suicide. And I'll be more specific. They were not asked to determine whether it was suicide. They were asked to determine whether it was a homicide. And of course, if a jury believed it were a suicide, they would have found you not guilty. That would have been their reasonable doubt. But that's not what they did. But that investigation, like any investigation into a death, doesn't happen overnight doesn't happen in a vacuum. Samples are taken from the body, and those samples are ultimately tested. What I think is really interesting for me is that somewhere along the way, a very astute scientist thought it was important enough to ask NMS labs, and that's, I'm sure, one of their scientists, to include in their expanded panel tetrahydrazoline, an over-the-counter, well, a drug found in over-the-counter medication. I don't want to say it was a trend, but I know when listening to the testimony of Dr. Kosinko, she said one of her responsibilities was to look for trends in drugs. And even when we listened and heard Dr. B testify, she talked about how while this may have been the first poisoning she had seen through tetrahydrazoline, it was not the first time she was faced with looking at something novel or new as part of her job. I mean, scientists do this all the time. They take known information, known data, 
known research, and when faced with something not seen before, they render opinions, they extrapolate. That's how medicine grows and advances are made, whether it be by pathologists who are medical examiners or cancer researcher. And if you kind of flip it around and think about cancer research, we would praise someone for that type of work. And so unbeknownst to everyone in this courtroom, in 2018, tetrahydrazoline was not something we expected to find. It was not something any of these detectives knew was even going to be screened for. It was not something the medical examiner knew to screen for. And I do believe it was something you, Ms. Kershevsky, banked on no one testing for. As you know, I sat through this entire trial, and not just this trial, but obviously the entire case, presiding over a variety of motion hearings, including the Daubert motions, where we, I, I heard from a couple of the experts and made some rulings. And I know you take issue with a lot of my rulings, and I will gladly, gladly challenge those. You can challenge those on appeal. I'm one person sitting up here doing the best that I can, given the law and the facts that are before me. And if, whether it's three individuals on the Court of Appeals, if that's appropriate, or all the way up to the Supreme Court wants to review and tell me I got it wrong, I am human, but I don't think I got it wrong in this case. You may not agree with the decisions that I made, but let me tell you, I did my utmost to ensure that you had a fair trial. Every step along the way, wanting to make sure if I delayed something, you were okay with it because I knew, because you made it abundantly clear, you were waiting for your day in court. And you and I had a number of colloquies or conversations in this courtroom or other courtrooms about the delays. Because honestly, I wanna make sure that any trial, especially a homicide trial, is done right the first time. It's of no benefit to anyone if a trial, if convictions get reversed on appeal. It happens sometimes. There's advances or new evidence or whatever the case may be. You complain, for example, about my protective order. And I think little do you realize, not only did I put that in place for the integrity of these proceedings, it was put in place to protect you. See, I've sat in the shoes of Attorney Jones. I didn't like when there were surprises. As an attorney, as a defense attorney, I wanted to control the narrative as best as I could to protect my client and his or her rights. Now, when I was on the other side, in the state's table or at the state's table, I used to train police officers on confessions. I love confessions. Why do I love confessions? Makes my job easier as a prosecutor. So I have this unique ability that really not a lot of judges have to look at both sides and now really the third side as a judge and kind of see what's going on. And so every time you make an extra statement, you complicate things for your defense team. That's your right to do it. But I wasn't going to have that happen until this case. I, I didn't want to have extrajudicial statements, meaning outside a court trial, or in this case, a sentencing as well, that could impugn the integrity of these proceedings. It's not good for you. It's not good for the case. I want to make sure we have a jury that's fair and impartial. And in this particular case, there were extra steps taken because of the interest. You may not have, I guess, liked, I'm gathering from your statements here today, that there were cameras in the courtroom and that this was on court TV and law and crime and other things. But here's the thing. I learned during and following the pandemic when we shut down courts or at least limited them to a great degree, what I learned 
is I started doing live streaming because that was a way for people to still be engaged, to watch what's going on, to keep our courts open and operating during a time of uncertainty. People were very interested. The court system and the legal system is critiqued and criticized all the time for not being transparent. So by having cameras in the courtroom, when there is that interest, I believe it fosters transparency. It's not about sensationalizing this. I did a very, very extensive trial order on that to make sure that didn't happen. You're not wrong that there's an interest and that people do different things with that interest. We are seeing trials televised more and more. People are fascinated with the legal system. I had a request and I granted it. Nothing more, nothing less. But some of my rules and requirements were meant to make sure that Nonetheless, things were fair and impartial. Fair and impartial doesn't mean you're going to agree with everything that I do. Fair and impartial doesn't mean you're going to agree with how a jury decides this case, how it's investigated, how it's presented. There's a lot of law on evidence. There's a lot of case law, volumes of it, on what comes in, what doesn't come in. Some of those rules impacted evidence coming into this case. Other things are beyond my control, whether the state chooses to offer something or not, or whether your own attorneys choose to offer something or not. But a courtroom isn't a free-for-all either. I do my very best to ensure that relevant evidence comes into the courtroom and reliable evidence. So I sat through this case, 16 days of trial from beginning to end, not including sentencing and any of the things that happened following the conviction. 36 witnesses. We had four expert witnesses, two pathologists, a uh, pharmacologist, um, and then a toxicologist. And they heard a lot about tetrahydrazoline. What I learned about tetrahydrazoline is how it affects the human body. I had the criminal complaint, obviously, all throughout this case, but until a case goes through the trial process, I don't really know what all is going to come in. I have a good idea, but I didn't know the breadth or the depth of it. I didn't know other than filings, for example, with the medical examiner and the Daubert motions. You know. I, that's the first time I really got a lot of that information with substance. And a lot of times I don't even have that information until there's a trial. But what did I learn? What, what is tetrahydrazoline? I think at its simplest, it's a sedative, right? It's a, it's a substance that when used as approved for eye drops or nasal spray, it constricts. Right? So it helps people breathe who have nasal congestion and it helps with redness in the eyes. It is not approved for oral use. What do we know from the literature that's out there that predates this case? Some of it obviously coming in around or even after is that there's really only two types of ingestions that are seen in the literature. Accidental or malicious. No known literature about people dying from voluntarily ingesting it for a suicide. Why is that? Because that's a big question that I've, I think needs to be answered. And that's because I think it's the last way anyone would ever commit suicide because of how it affects the human body. It makes people sick. 
You weren't the first person to think about tetrahydrazoline. There have been movies and even Law and Order episodes, or an episode that I happened to see at one point, where there's some poisoning. We know from Henry Spiller, your own witness, he encouraged the FBI to look into it or get it on a list because of its use related to sexual assaults, that malicious ingestion, right, a poisoning. But like I said, at its core, it's a sedative. And, and how does it affect the system? Um, during Dr. No, I think it was uh, Ms. Kosinko's uh, testimony, she talked about how it, in, when ingested, and I obviously, unknowingly, right, it's odorless, it's tasteless, you can give it to someone without them ever knowing it, it can reduce inhibitions, it, cr it creates, uh, causes someone to be lethargic, um, it has a significant impact when in large amounts that shouldn't be in one's system on, it's a CNS depressant, right, so ultimately it affects breathing and heart rate and brain functioning and can lead to death. After listening and seeing and reading through all the evidence, just like the jury did, and I don't know what they ultimately or why they ultimately concluded it's a homicide, they don't have to explain their verdict. They just render a verdict all having to agree. But as I saw everything, I have to ask out loud, it's in a rhetorical question, but were you poisoning Lynn Hernan all along, following your release from prison? No. I'm not asking for an answer. This is my time. So do not interrupt me. She got markedly sicker following your reinsertion in her life on a daily basis, ultimately ending up in the hospital in September of 2018. Unexplained, couldn't figure out what was going on. But what do we know? She got better. What could not have been happening in the hospital? Someone poisoning her with THZ too much risk associated with that, cameras, whatever it may be. And I think that gave you the green light. You said, I went undetected, because what I think was happening is that you were using it to control Lynn Hernan, to steal from her, to gain control of her accounts. And I think you targeted her. I agree with the state's assessment on that. The perfect victim. No children, no parents, they were deceased with a fair amount of money. Why do I say that? Well, your past matters. Your past convictions for forgery, uttering, and misappropriation of personal identifying information matter. Because I'm a big proponent and believer that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. That's not to say people can't change, but we know you targeted people. And from my perspective, some ver in a very aggravated way, because you, it's real easy to say, well, those convictions happened in 2011 and this didn't happen until 2018, but you were revoked once following being in prison for about a year it was one year of initial confinement, three years of extended supervision on each of those counts. You get revoked in, so you're sentenced in 2011, you're released in 2012, you're revoked in 2014, you go back to prison, I think it was about 26 months or so, you're released again in February, late February of 2018. And it's shortly thereafter that these thefts start happening. And it's shortly thereafter that Lynn Hernan gets sicker 
and sicker. Now, I'm not sentencing you here today because I think you poisoned her all along. I'm sentencing you because a jury convicted you of a homicide based upon that. But I think it's important for everyone in this courtroom to know that's what I see. And that's what the evidence points to. Very planned, very deceitful. Maybe it wasn't your intent to kill Lynn Hernan, I don't know. Do I believe this was a suicide? Absolutely not. There's a lot of holes in the stories that you have told. I think you think you're smarter than everyone in this courtroom. All of your statements come after you get information that you now have to explain. Those letters, no way Lynn Hernan wrote those either herself or willingly. Or willingly. And I think that's supported by the thefts in this case. It's supported when you understand the, how tetrahydrazoline affects her, affects individuals. And that why do people choose it for a, uh, to assault someone? Because it can impair them. It can make them lethargic. It can make them lose their own inhibitions. It really, in those circumstances, with that malicious intent, is to control someone. I think the evidence points pretty squarely to that. I am not going to go through every single piece of evidence. I'm not going to go through every single witness. But it's important to really lay this, set the stage, so to speak, for why I believe um, not why I believe, but for how I'm going to sentence you here today. And really to respond to some of the things that you, your mom, and others have said on your behalf. You know, it is one thing to maintain your innocence. I, su I support the jury system. I support people making the state prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. That's what makes the system that we have in the United States so great. I'm not here to tell you it's perfect every step along the way. We're a system filled with human beings. But I don't see this as one of those cases where it's just an all out, let's get Jesse Krzyzewski. There's no reason for anyone here to make anything up. You are the common denominator that brings all of us here today. It is your actions, not theirs, and it's not Lynn's. I find it interesting that you criticize people like Anthony Poza, Kareem Poza, Jim Kelleher, and others for not knowing Lynn, for not getting her help for, you know, you criticize them for saying, well, she wasn't suicidal. They didn't know her. They weren't close to her in the last year of her life. But ironically, you want us to believe all the statements that you've made, and yet you'll back off and say, but I wish I could have done more. I wish I would have seen more. I, I have these regrets because I didn't get her more help. I don't think you can hold those beliefs together. I think they're opposed to each other. I think it's a convenient position to take when you criticize them, and yet you can't go so far as to say, well, I saw it all. You have to stop short of that. Otherwise, you couldn't claim that you didn't know she was suicidal. And of course, we know that story changed over time. You are, I think, very upset 
over this thing about Whitnall Park. Here's the thing. You were in custody, okay? I don't know if, it's very, very rare for police to take someone out of custody. But what they did was pretty amazing. They got you on what we'd call a FaceTime call, some type of video from their conference room at the jail to direct individuals. You want us to believe this evidence that exonerates you exists, and yet you had what? October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, up to July 8th, at any point in time to go get it if it really existed. You had all the opportunity in the world to make sure if that evidence existed to secure it in a way that was accessible, not in the ground, at a park. Doesn't make sense. Same thing really with the letters that happened to show up after Lynn died. When were those turned over? Again, rhetorical question. I even listen to how you talk about the will and the wills and how this whole test thing with Anthony. Here's the thing. The initial will that was submitted to Judge Maxwell was typewritten and witnessed by strangers at a bank. You want us to believe that Lynn Hernan changed her will and didn't follow the same procedure that she did for the will that was initially admitted into probate and what stood. By the way, a will can't be witnessed by the beneficiaries. Would never have worked. If she were that suicidal and making all of these plans to kill herself and change her will, Lynn Hernan was smart enough to know how to do it the right way if, in fact, she was the one to do it. You have someone draft it, and you have neutral witnesses, like she did the first time. You go to a bank. You get it notarized. That's not what she did. There are a lot of holes in your version of events. And here's the thing. I didn't get the ability, nor did the jury, to have your story tested for its veracity. You have the absolute right at a trial not to testify. And there are pros and cons to doing so. You claim to regret not testifying. But the jury didn't get to hear that. That was your choice. That's not on me. That's not on the state. That's on you. The other thing I want to comment on you want us to believe that you and your mom were so close to Lynn Hernan that you loved her and cared for her more than anybody else. And yet you unabashedly throw her under the bus and impugn her character with these wild stories. You want us to believe that she killed herself because she killed her mom in the same way that she was killed. And again, poisoning oneself with Visine drops would be the last way someone would commit suicide. It does not. There's no known literature support for 
tetrahydrazoline causing a state of euphoria and pain relief and sleep. I'll, I should rephrase that last one. Making someone fall asleep. I suppose it could because of the effects as a CNS depressant, but the other effects on the digestive system and making one sick, again, no way. I think that's probably why a jury rejected because perhaps they came to that same conclusion that it just was not believable. Oh, the one other thing I wanted to comment on because you referenced it as well was the fact that you couldn't, didn't or couldn't review the restitution information. It's a pretty standard order that I get. It's a request for an order from the state due to victim rights legislation and the constitutional amendment to seal restitution information. But the order that I signed says that parties to the case are permitted access. You're a party to the case. Whether your attorney chose to give it to you or not, I don't know. I want to refocus this because what we're here today is really about giving voice to the one person who cannot speak today, and that's Lynn Hernan. It's about honoring her life and punishing you as the person found legally responsible for her death. She cannot respond to any of the accusations that you and your mom have levied against her. She's gone. And you've taken away from your own life, but for Anthony, and Kareen, and Jim, and Keith, and all the other individuals. A bright light, as Anthony said, extinguished far too soon. You took that away. You took away future memories, birthday parties, luncheons, phone calls. You may have been with Lynn that last year or so of her life. But what do killers sometimes do? They target their victims, they isolate them, they control the narrative, they stay or show up at scenes. I mean, the bottom line is homicides generally don't make a lot of sense. It's the taking of another life intentionally. It defies all notions of goodness and decency. They don't make sense. And sometimes they're wild and crazy. And people like you do strange things. I believe for the sole purpose of trying to get away with it. I do believe you thought you had found the perfect way to take Lynn Hernan out, that it would go undetected and again, maybe that wasn't initially. Maybe it was just to control the finances, to take her for the money that she had. But I think when she got to the hospital in September, and no one at that hospital found that substance, and you were getting to the end of the money, and really the only thing left of value was that condo. Lynn Hernan was better to you dead than alive, and you thought you could get away with it. You know, when I sentence individuals, there's a number of sentencing criteria. They fall into three main categories, the seriousness of the offense, the need to protect the public, and your character and rehabilitative needs. Your character includes who you are, sitting here before me, the good, the bad, the indifferent. It includes your past convictions. They are important, especially as it relates to counts two and three, because there's a pattern in your life of taking advantage of people, whether it be your mom, 
your grandmother, whether it be uh, patients in a clinic that you work at or the mother of a friend you're living with. And you explain it away as, well, I had a gambling addiction. I just wanted to live. I needed a place, a roof over my head, however you described it in those moments. I think you thought you were a very good thief and that you could get away with even more. The seriousness of those theft convictions, well, let me go back. So I don't want you to walk out of here thinking, I don't think you have any redeeming qualities. I mean, obviously, while in the jail, I think you've tried to do what you can to make the most of unfortunate circumstances at your own hand. You obviously very diligently review all of the discovery materials. You do what you can to do your own research, to educate yourself. You help other inmates. I think you were blessed to have maybe some additional money coming in on your canteen and you uh, will help individuals who don't have any. I don't even frankly care what the motives are, whether they're purely good motives or if there's a pecking order back there, I don't, I don't know. But I do know you, have, you made a friend and she said some very nice things about you today. Honestly, the only person I was really hoping to hear more from your mom about you. I have a lot in the PSI and the private PSI about that. But your mom spent every moment of her statement attacking everyone else in this courtroom and Lynn. Whereas Ms. McCarthy came in is what we hope for and expect of character witnesses to Tell me more about this other side. Because I, I do believe people are multifaceted. People have many sides. Even in the worst cases, like a homicide, there are redeeming qualities. And she told us about those. And I thank her for doing that. About how you took her under your wing. You kind of developed this relationship. You had lunch together, meals together, prayed together, did some studies together and you helped her through a very trying time, as she said, being 70 and never incarcerated before, I'm sure that was not easy. And so I, I think there is a side to you that does care. I don't want you to think that I, I don't think you have a caring side. I mean, clearly you do. You cared for Scott Craig, you cared for his children, and in your own way, um, you made them feel important and loved. Now, there was another side to you, and I think he got it right when he described you. I mean, he, I think there was a reason you never introduced him to Lynn Hernan. I find that interesting. 